We now enter the very last session of the Doha Forum, which entails a bit of a generational shift. We just ended the previous session talking about one of the oldest institutions in the world, an institution that's turning 75. Well, our next guest is very far away from his 75th birthday. In fact, he is one of the world's youngest and newest heads of state. He took office just over six months ago when he won the presidential elections in June of this year in El Salvador. He is a political leader who understands and appreciates and knows the power of technology and social media. In fact, many of you will remember when he made his first speech at the United Nations General Assembly, he took out his cell phone and, yes, he marked the occasion with a selfie. So I do hope he'll have time for a selfie with me a little later. It is a pleasure to welcome to the stage President Nayib Bukele of El Salvador. Thank you, everybody. Your Excellency, Abdullah bin Nasser bin Khalifa Al Thani, Prime Minister of Qatar. Your Excellencies, Prime Ministers, members of cabinets of all the countries participating in this forum, my wife, Gabriela, and my daughter, Laila, who's just turned four months today. <laughs> members of my cabinet and staff that came with me to Doha, members of the press and all the new media, a special guest, ladies and gentlemen, friends, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to give the closing remarks in this World Forum, where we have analyzed the urgent necessity to reimagine governance and multilateralism in an ever-changing world. But I wanted to raise the question that has been mentioned here numerous times with many interesting analysis, probable, possible answers, and even conclusions. But all of our main questions regarding inequality, poverty, globalization, trade, governance, interconnectivity, youth, the fourth industrial revolution, jobs, wealth, the rule of law, climate change, even peace, have been analyzed without really looking deep into the unique moment of all human civil that human civilization is living today. And this huge opportunity that we have right now the uniqueness of this moment is actually very short and very simple to explain. But don't expect an answer because I and my team were only able to formulate the question. And this is the question. For the first time in human history, our civilization has achieved three benchmarks that were impossible to imagine a couple of decades ago. These three benchmarks allows us, for the first time in history, to fix all of the main problems of the world. Now, the first benchmark. Remember in the 90s, where globalization was the main topic in all of the forums, panels, everywhere? Well, I was in school and probably watching cartoons and play, playing video games. But the reality is that at the time we discussed globalization, if it, globalization was good or bad, if it was good for rich countries or for poor countries. We discussed if it was good for corporations or good for the people. The supporters of globalization tried always to convince us that it would be good for everyone. But aside if you like it or not, globalization came to stay. Soon, we felt the pros and cons of globalization. It made the world a lot richer. International commerce and trade boomed and created lots of new opportunities. But at the same time, it also bankrupted hundreds of thousands of local companies. It destroyed entire economies. Hundreds of millions of farmers and their families emigrated to the cities in search for a living. Millions fell into poverty as local industries bankrupted and as major corporations moved their factories where labor was cheaper. But like I said before, you may like it, you may hate it, 
But 25 years later, the world is fully globalized now. And that's our first benchmark, a globalized world. Now, the second benchmark. Remember back in the 90s again, where the internet really started to take traction? I mean, we all know that it was invented decades ago, but it really took traction in the 90s. As every important company had a web page and teenagers were downloading illegal music from Napster and messaging through ICQ or AOL instant messages. Thousands of new dot-com millionaires and even billionaires started to appear as the market was overvaluing web traffic and paying hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for a web page. Then the bubble bursted and the economy tanked as the stock market took a gigantic hit from the, the dot-com bubble. But despite the economies of it, the internet was still growing very fast, in fact, exponentially. It is now an integral part of our lives. We live now in an interconnected world. We spend more time in our phones than any other thing. I'm not taking a selfie, don't worry. Yet. In fact, they are not phones anymore. You have your life recorded here. You have all of your friends texting you while I'm saying this speech. You have all of your social networks here. Your apps, your health, your mail, your music, videos. You get your news from this thing. Some people watch the movies on it, play, even create content for the whole world to see. And every year, it penetrates more and more. More apps are developed, the cameras are better, more people connect. So even though we're two or three years from total connectivity, we can say we're there. So that's our second benchmark, an interconnected world. Now the third benchmark. For the first time in all of human history, we produce more than what we are able to consume, and definitely more than what we need to consume. We have more than enough food to feed everyone. We have more than enough medicine to treat everyone. We have more than enough wealth and materials so can everyone can have a decent home. A nice school for all children. A good hospital for anyone with a disease. All necessary roads can be built. All necessary transportation systems can be built. We have enough wealth to stop climate change, to even undo some of the damage we have done to our planet. We have enough wealth and resources to stop all armed conflicts, to provide a decent living for everyone. But instead of that, millions of tons of fresh food are dumped every day while millions of humans are, being, are dying of hunger and malnutrition. Millions of tons of medicine are destroyed because their due dates are passed, while millions of people don't have access to healthcare or even vaccination. Inequalities on the rise and unnecessary conflicts are created. But with all the bad things happening, one thing is certain. Production and worldwide wealth is at all time high. And that's our third benchmark. World production is now enough for everyone. Humanity never dreamed of having these three ingredients, but now we have them. So we are now able to end poverty, to end hunger, to care for everyone's health, to provide a great education for everyone, to stop climate change, to stop all wars. We just need the political will of the leaders of the world. This couldn't have been done before. This couldn't have been said before. Because the world wasn't globalized. So if you needed a perk from India and you were in Mexico, well, what is it? that was a tough one. Before the world was interconnected, 
just to give you an example, a health record from a person in Brazil could take days and a lot of resources to reach a doctor treating that same person in Germany. A software developer in, in El Salvador, in my country, could not collaborate with a developer in Japan, and both of them be able to create something new, putting pieces together from both sides of the world. Now they can. Before we produce enough for, of everything, we couldn't feed some without leaving others with no food. Nations and societies had to compete only to survive. But we have none of those problems anymore. We are now fully globalized, fully interconnected, and we produce more than what we need to consume. So there, no more excuses, no more benchmarks to be met, no more time to wait. To wait. So we are obliged, it is our responsibility to create the world every generation since the dawn of civilization has dreamed of. We have the three ingredients humanity never had before. Let's find the formula for this new era. So, what are we waiting for? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Bukele, for helping us end this forum on such an uplifting, positive note. I, too, brought my cell phone, just in case we could do that selfie. We could, oh, we could do it now. Okay, excuse us for just a second. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, President Bukele. And so now, as we do end this session, it is a pleasure to thank you all for being here, for making it such a memorable event. Thank you, of course, to our host, Doha, and the state of Qatar. I also want to thank all the wonderful panelists and speakers we've had over the past two days.